reading your abstracts though that you are interested in reproducing small variations in the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah, oh, that's for sure. And I, I would imagine the the interest in that is to see how variations that are seemingly connected with uh, solar activity would play a role in the development or behavioral adjustments um, during the cycles of the sun, whether they be small or large or temporal in their nature, are affecting our behavioral patterns, not only humans, but animals as well. That's for sure. That's exactly it. Now, has this been corroborated from your department to other departments, such as the physics department, with any behavior in the upper atmosphere, such as proton storms, and or through the uh, paleontology, through... Well, I can, I can we'll, we'll, we'll certainly talk about that in a second here. Mm -hmm. Well, challenging in the fun, yeah. Wait, wait this is the Petroglyph yeah, thing? Yeah, right off Peter Roll. Ah. So it's all in here. And of course, we our big thing is the sensed presence and how to induce it experimentally. Mm -hmm. And I, got, I think uh, these are all relevant, I think, to... And we've actually produced this and then it goes in the laboratory by stimulating the brain in appropriate ways. Mm -hmm. So everything I think you'd probably want to know about, at least in terms of our experimental work, right here. So why don't you sit down here and ask me some questions, and we can... I might be thank you. Go ahead and get yourself set up there so we can have a chat. Mm -hmm. So this... Let's sit down here. Is it yeah. Well, I'm just adjusting is usually my game, but I'll, in terms of making your comfort here, I'll, I'm usually behind the camera, but that's probably... Okay, well just pull up a chair there, and you're, you're, the, you're the guy, you're the smart guy, you got me all the integration. <laughs> well... All right, so go ahead. Don't give me all the credit. Um, and I'm looking at the camera. Um, it's up to you. That's not, no. That's, uh, yeah, back there's, and forth. There's a good angle. All right. Um, how did this all start for you? What was the key for you finding how magnetic fields started to affect neural behavior? Well, the major thrust of science is to integrate levels of discourse. As you know, uh, what we call levels of discourse, be it physics, chemistry, biology, Mm -hmm. psychology, sociology, ge geography, and astronomy. These are arbitrary divisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always been interested in how to relate the levels of discourse from the atom to the behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, each level of discourse, biology, chemistry, physics, whatever, has its own terminology, but there's no way to relate them. Mm -hmm. Because once you go outside the level of discourse, you just have different language. And there's only one force that's manipulable experimentally, and that's magnetic fields. So 40 years ago, well, 45 mm -hmm. years ago, I decided to uh, assess the effects of magnetic fields on biological systems because that's the only force that you can experimentally manipulate at the level of the atom, at the level of the cell, at the level of the molecule, at the level of the behavior, and it doesn't change. It's still a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. It's not a molecule, it's not a cell, it's a particular stimulus. So that's how I got started, and then I realized mm -hmm. that uh, in my interest in looking at how life began, uh, I did a series of abiogenesis studies uh, after Miller and that group, and um, began to realize that it's very likely that proteins were the first to be developed. Mm -hmm. And the proteins, uh, of course, are amino acids. And, um, and with amino acid sequences, you can generate them right from geomagnetic activity, mm -hmm. right? specifically if there's a discharge, appropriate discharge. Can you give me an example? Of well, for, well, if, if, for example, you take primitive gases and put a discharge through them, you can get some of the classic carboxyl and amine groups to make up uh, amino acids. Mm. Uh, at the time this probably occurred, the Schumann resonance was probably even more powerful than it is today. So uh, one of the hypotheses that gradually emerged over the, over the decades was that we may store information in a DNA sequence. That's mm -hmm. a very stable way of doing it. But initially the information may have been stored as electromagnetic sequences. Some of the words are maybe an electromagnetic blueprint. Now that's not my idea. There's a very, very old history from Harold Burr going back to uh, uh, a number of uh, great thinkers in the 19th century, late 19th century, and early 20th century. Mm. Uh, and, um, excuse me a second. 
Uh, this is going to be about a half an hour on one film. Okay. All right. I'll see you by half an hour. Thanks. So, um, so I, I think what the thrust began to, I'll put it this way, the, th the idea began to emerge from the data that there was an intricacy of electromagnetic fields in the environment from the Earth itself, modulated by the Sun, mm -hmm. that directly controlled the essential aspects of living, specifically life forms. That it was evident that geomagnetic activity had very specific effects on human behavior, but it was masked by the fact that it's so complex, geomagnetic activity is so complex that when you average it out, it's like saying, I'm going to measure all six billion people and take their weight. Mm -hmm. And you take an average and it's, you say, okay, wow, well, okay, they weigh about 50, 60 kilograms. <coughs> That's everybody. But it doesn't tell you about the richness of the individual differences. So um, it became evident to me that whereas structure in a molecule, the position of the atoms determine its function, that the temporal pattern and the complexity of the temporal pattern in electromagnetic fields determine their function. Mm -hmm. So that for every chemical effect there was an electromagnetic equivalent. Now what that Rosetta Stone is that transforms the two is still being investigated experimentally. But that was the original thrust. Is that mm -hmm. too detailed for you? No, that's good. Okay. So part of these geomagnetic activities, were they found localized? And if so Well, no actually actually you can think of it this way. The geomagnetic field is a relatively stable field. Mm -hmm. Uh, the geomagnetic activity, when it occurs, is not more than about a percent or so of the intensity of the static fields. The static mm -hmm. field, on average, is 50,000 nanotesla, mm -hmm. about a half a gauss. Mm -hmm. When you have a typical geomagnetic perturbation, the, the big waving kinds of changes are on the order of 100 to 200 nanotesla. Once in a while, you make it up to 10,000, 1,000 nanotesla. So you're looking at less than a percent, roughly. So in many respects, this has something in common with the brain. The brain of, uh, has a steady potential, uh, which is about 10 to 20 millivolts, and superimposed on it about one, one hundredth or a percent of its amplitude mm -hmm. is the EG. So the EG is a little ripple mm -hmm. on top of this very, very stable steady potential, very much like geomagnetic activity being that little ripple on top of the static field. And similarly, the ratios are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, it's also interesting that if you solve for the resonant frequency, of the Earth based upon its circumference and the ionospheric features, it turns out to be about 7 hertz as using the speed of light for the movement of electromagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. If you take the brain of a human, typical cerebrum, and the bulk velocity of axon action potentials, uh, and you look at the circumference of the, uh, of the human brain, it turns out to be about 7 hertz. So mm -hmm. the organization of the brain and the organization of the Earth is such that resonance is very, very likely to occur. Mm. Now these are very, very weak, weak fields. Mm. And most of my colleagues who are really competent in the area have come to a very similar conclusion, that would be people like Sandek, that, uh, that the brain probably works in the area of, um, of a picotesla, mm. uh, which is well below the typical ripple or whisper frequency of the Earth itself. Mm -hmm. So those are global features. Now. Uh, now, once you have the, the geomagnetic activity that crashes electrical systems and transmission and mm -hmm. power grids, don't forget there's this little teeny ripple that's much more complex. Um, and I guess one way to look at it is if you have extreme excursions, they're highly sinusoidal. But if you reduce the amplitude, you have more degrees of freedom for complexity of information. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take the brain for example. Uh, in EEG, when you have alpha activity or delta activity, four of these per second, they're very, very rhythmic and very, very symmetrical in large part. Mm -hmm. if, you de if you basically take the same amplitude and make it a faster frequency, all right, so the mm -hmm. same area under the curve, mm -hmm. it's a faster frequency, that means that height is going to be less, but there's more of them. It can be more jigs and jags, and that means mm -hmm. more information being transmitted. So the real transmission within the Earth itself, in terms of biological systems, is going to be this really low intensity complex frequency that we just begin to measure, or we just begin to measure. Mm -hmm. How does this 
correlate with cycles or activity that is occurring with the sun? Well, you can say with uh, great certainty that basically all life comes from the sun. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Sure. Uh, I mean, mind you, the carbon within our bodies comes from large stars. If, if you think of it, you go back way, a long ways away. Mm -hmm. But uh, largely the sun is the source of everything because it's the source of heat. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes through a 22-year cycle. Uh, most people think of the 11-year cycle, but for the full cycle, it's 22, mm -hmm. because there's a polarity switch that the, the amplitude changes, or, or yeah, like 10 and a half to 11, so, yeah. but the actual true cycle is about 22 years. And since the uh, the sun is constantly expanding its corona, uh, what we experience as the solar wind uh, mm -hmm. in the order of 500 to 1,000 kilometers per second. Uh, that constantly presses on the geomagnetic static field, sort of like a, uh, they put into a, a spring being pushed. Mm -hmm. And because it's a heterogeneous expansion, it oscillates mm -hmm. and you have a big, big perturbation. Mm -hmm. You can get, of course, the, the pressure will increase and the more pressure you put on the flux lines, you get an increase in intensity on the surface. As it's rarefied and bounces back, there's a decrease in intensity. And that's what you see as the geomagnetic storm. But superimposed on, on these larger, larger changes is all these minute changes mm -hmm. that are very local in large part, but all the ones that are within the range that are influencing biological systems. Don't forget that uh, this is a complex system, not beyond comprehension, but simply complex. Mm -hmm. One example would be, as you know, we have the Earth, and that's the Sun, during a full moon would be on that side. The nature of the Earth's magnetic field is that the pressure put from the expanding solar corona, the solar, solar wind basically, pulls out the magnetic field behind it, such to the point that there's really no flux lines to speak of, producing a kind of neutral sheet. That neutral sheet will extend roughly out to the distance of the moon. Mm -hmm. So during full moon, as it moves through, the full moon moves through that neutral sheet and perturbates the particles that are trapped within it, they move down into the stratosphere and are in large part responsible for that well-known correlation of uh, increased thunderstorm activity and a number of other interesting meteorological phenomena uh, just at and to the, within two or three days after a whole moon. Mm -hmm. So these are subtle effects. Now, this uh, four to five nanotesla perturbation that's associated with lunar components, that's mm -hmm. the lunar component of the geomagnetic activity, usually seen only during solar quiet periods like we have now, at least we're supposed to have now. <laughs> yeah. um, those patterns we found to be significantly powerful enough to influence um, or be correlated with the, uh, the birth rates, particularly in males and human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, we do know, and this has been known since the days of Menacher and Menacher, using 500,000 line births from the state of New York over a 10-year period, that, uh, that the full moon effect is very clear on birth rates. Now, it's not enough to be seen at a single hospital. It's not a big effect. You're only talking about a couple, 3% in terms of the peak. But it's enough over an epidemiological distance, for example, millions of people, you will see this full moon effect. But it's not as large or as intense as the mythology that goes with it, but it's still there fundamentally. Mm -hmm. What we found experimentally, when we imitated a 5 nanotesla, that's a very weak field, mm -hmm. uh, barely detectable with most magnetometers, at least conventional magnetometers, that we could influence uh, the number of line births in rats very significantly with a 5 nanotesla field. And again, we need a very large sample size to demonstrate it, but it's quite reliable. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of thing you see classically in experimental designs where four or five animals in a group, you see the effect. This is a very weak effect size, but it's there mm -hmm. and would be the type that would be typical of the evolutionary selection factors mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in population biology. Now, how does this all correlate with a trend of activity that we're seeing changing the human frequency and how this interrelates into sort of the net neural behavior or an evolutionary precursor, how does it interrelate neurologically with hormonal activity with respect to this increasing human frequency and the dropping geomagnetic field. Um, well, the, well the Earth's magnetic field per se has, has uh, the intensity has not been dropping in a systematic way. And depending upon who you read and what you read, I mean, in the 1960s, everyone was anticipating a reversal. Uh -huh. okay. And that never happened. So there's a great deal of fluctuation. And when you're dealing with, with periodicities for which you don't know the 
uh, the actual theta value, the actual, the actual value for the fluctuation, then little perturbations can give you ideas of trends that aren't really true. It's like mm -hmm. having a big, big cycle with a bunch of random variations, and if you're just a, looking at that one small random variation, then you might predict you're going up or down depending upon where you are, but it tells you nothing about the big picture. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do know is that the, um, the, the uh, Schumann resonance is still present. Now, mind you, the amount of communication systems that are affecting the system uh, could be sufficient to begin influencing biological systems. Mm -hmm. uh, a very nice Scandinavian study showed that the melanoma correlation that people always associate with UV mm -hmm. is actually correlated with the use of RF frequencies in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. This was published about a year ago. So, the, the, the question I think you want to, would like to ask is, is the environment created by man now producing a secondary matrix, all right, which is going to influence our evolution, not only of ourselves, but every, every living being on the planet? And the answer is yes, there is, because theoretically at least, because the minute you generate uh, lots of different sources, particular electromagnetics uh, involved with um, cell phones and uh, communication systems, it's not the high frequency that's the critical factor, because most of these are in the gigahertz range. Mm -hmm. It's the beats, and by beats, uh, put it this way: if you have a thousand hertz tone and a thousand ten hertz tone, a very very high frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, if you combine the two, you get a third tone being generated from that matrix, which is only ten hertz, very low mm -hmm. frequency. It's the difference between the two. It's called a beat. Mm -hmm. And these beats are the ones that we would be most concerned with, because the beats would ultimately emerge to lower and lower and lower frequencies to well within the biological system range. Uh, as we get more and more of these high frequency patterns into the environment. Mm -hmm. This is somewhat like what Monroe found with his binaural beat patterns, you know, the cross mixing of one hemisphere with the other to produce well, a... Well, the, beat, the beating, yes, the Monroe Institute, which is notorious for its out-of-body and astral experiences, uh, the whole idea was to try to synchronize mm -hmm. uh, the two hemispheres, and if you apply uh, slightly different frequencies, those are, these are auditory atomic frequencies, you can get these kinds of uh, interesting beats. I mean, I think that's the whole point of an orchestra, really. Mm -hmm. All right, think about it. Mm -hmm. It's to produce this uh, beat that's basically for, this, for the, uh, the whole grid of the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, you can do that, but you require complexity. By that, I mean you need more than one signal. Mm -hmm. See, what I found, there's three things, and you've got a paper about the perception of time. Right. And I found three things in my adventures that are main themes towards the affecting of time. One is, you know, directly your consciousness. One seems to be the sun, which correlates to how the cesium atom is migrating from one isotope to another, and or whether it be carbon and the enzymatic activities associated with the, the, the photosynthesis is correlated with that, but it seems that the sun also mitigates our isotopic movements, which correlate to how we measure time. And then there's a third component, which is the pyramid effect, which is the geometrical principle, which in some other paperwork I'm looking at correlating between the electromagnetic field and the crystalline vibrational substrate of all things is the vibrational pulsing movements of polyhedral moment centers, nuclear okay. centers. So I'm looking at how you reproduced these micro Gauss fields. Um, excuse me, that may not be totally accurate, but they were seemingly recreating different conditions which I saw as some of these centers that interrelate to shamanic experiences at these slightly arborated magnetic field centers, which help them gain some form of initiation experience. So it seems that there's a trend of these fields that were seeked by these initiates or shamans at these centers, but there's also a global manifestation that seems to be changing the trend, which I've seen some corollaries with the magnetic field okay. and the mind calendar, which is seemingly initiating us all through the ancient prophecies of many indigenous okay. cultures. All right. Well, first of all, that's uh, what you've said there. I could probably lecture on for about two, three hours. But <laughs> yeah. First of all, subjective time is quite different than objective time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, um, uh, the second factor, you're totally correct, that ultimately changes in timing Mm -hmm. and the brain are involved with different kinds of experiences. Now, let me give you the overall approach we've been using. We know that information is limited by the brain, that there are billions of stimuli out there, and maybe your brain attends to maybe four or five per second in that order. Mm -hmm. 
Um, maybe you can get maybe to a ten or so. We're talking about attending. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't feel EM fields right now. Right? There's just literally untold numbers of stimuli in your body. Why is that? Because there's no verbal label and you don't have a sensor. By applying the appropriate uh, rotational magnetic fields mm -hmm. that affect consciousness, and we now realize that consciousness is not continuous, that's an illusion. It's recreated every 20 to, uh, 20 to 25 milliseconds, roughly 40 to 50 hertz. And if you can slow that down with the time between the end of one quanta of consciousness, if you wish, mm -hmm. and the beginning of the next one, if you open that up, you seem to be, have access to all kinds of information that you typically do not have. We've shown that that's probably what uh, some of the special people have, such as Ingo Swan uh, and Sean Hiravance, when they came here, we measured their brains very carefully. And it appears to be very much like any kind of person who is sensitive to the environment. They just process information differently. So if you begin to change the organization of the brain, you change the sensor, because the brain itself can be seen as a whole sensor, as a, as a sensor itself. Mm -hmm. So you can do this with shamanistic practices, as my colleague Don Hill has been pursuing for many years. Uh, you can do it with drugs. You can do it by certain kind of rituals of deprivation, hypoxia, starvation, sensory isolation, instead of the cave like Mohammed did, or you can wander through the desert like Christ did. It seems to produce the same basic effect. You alter brain activity, and now you have access to information that you typically would not have access to. Mm -hmm. Now, which hemisphere is doing that? Well, our experimental work indicates it's the right hemisphere, the one that's not associated with the sense of self, mm -hmm. and that's probably one of the reasons that so much of the shamanist experiences are attributed to a, th a sentient being. Mm -hmm. That when you simulate the right hemisphere, you actually become aware of effectively what is your left hemispheric sense of self. And it's you, it's your brain, but you don't perceive it as such. It's perceived as a sentient being, somehow familiar, but somehow different. And every shaman in every culture has a familiar, a, uh, a totem, uh, a spirit guide, something equivalent, that basically, to whom they attribute their capacities and their, and their powers. That is a right hemispheric process. And the right hemisphere is highly specialized in the human brain for spatial orientation, for affect, for perceiving and perhaps uh, for certainly by, for dreaming. The dreaming is definitely a more right hemispheric process. And so that information that can be accessed, and that's what it is, accessed, during dreaming states now becomes more powerful and more easily obtained during shadow states. And it's a right hemispheric process. And we have shown that very clearly. Stimulate the right hemisphere. People have information that typically should not have within the realms of their education and culture. And they have the sense presence to whom they attribute, mm -hmm. the same way the Greeks used to call it the muses, mm -hmm. used to visit. And you're doing it through what, pr what process? Well, we apply very, very weak magnetic fields over the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, we have found that it is the right hemisphere. We know what patterns there are. Mm -hmm. And these patterns that generate this effectively are those which are associated with tribal rituals, specifically singing with a crescendo every four to five seconds. Uh, it's associated with patterns that are generated within the Earth itself around these sacred sites. So the question is, where is the information coming from? And that's where we are now. Uh, could the information be stored in the environment in the traditional Akashic record concept, which is shown in many cultures, mm -hmm. uh, disbelieved by most, but science really hasn't grappled with it yet. Uh, although Prebro certainly hinted at it when he argued about the holographic brain and the holographic universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, suffice it to say, without getting into calculations, the Earth's magnetic field has the energy to basically store uh, the information that has been generated, well, I should say, to store the, the energy in terms of joules uh, that's been generated by every human being for since the beginning of human beings. It has the capacity to store that. Whether it does it or not, it's a different story. But the next stage will be to try to find the equivalent. Uh, or the physical equivalence of what these old concepts are. Mm -hmm. Now, if the environment is perturbated, such as the geomagnetic storm or the solar cycle, you can see how this can influence thinking, mm -hmm. as well as your access. Now, in a general area, in a completely different area called paranormal, uh, about 30 years ago, I found that um, the geomagnetic activity was very, very quiet on days when people were having psi experiences, when they felt they could feel if someone at a distance was dying or something equivalent. Now, 
that doesn't, you don't have to believe or validate the fact that there's siphonol. I mean, it could, maybe it's not siphonol at all. In fact, I suspect it's not. It's some other process. But the point is, people seem to be able to pick up that someone has died or been under crisis condition. That's under a very weak geolimited condition. And that would be consistent with the fact that we are all connected in the geomagnetic field, just like six billion copper wires immersed in the same current. And under certain circumstances, such as the altered state of dreaming, we have the capacity to, uh, to access this information, mm -hmm. and depending on if the stimuli is correct or not. So perturbations, such as geomagnetic storms, interfere with the communication channels. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you're right on track by realizing that this is all integrated. Uh, the other piece of information that may be relevant for you, and then we're going to have to probably summarize this a bit, is that we also know, and certainly the, so the Soviets were very uh, astute to this, mm -hmm. that when you can look at the solar cycle, which big crudely reflects geomagnetic activity, correlation is about 0.7, using yearly increments, 0.8, mm -hmm. uh, that, that the left and right hemispheric dominance and personality styles, such as, married, uh, such as measured or inferred from Myers-Briggs, shows a solar cycle. Well, that's certainly 10 to 11 years, and if you look at both of them, two true, true cycle, that's 22 years, that's a generation, which means that every generation is going to be through a, technically a different cycle. And we have found, as many others, that exposure to developing, of, of developing fetuses to magnetic fields, mm -hmm. the kinds that occur in nature, can actually influence their morphology, specifically in the areas that have to do with sexual reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can you can uh, basically demasculinize or feminize the masculine brain by the appropriate magnetic field just around birth. This is in rats, which, which can be controlled experimentally, and you can measure the neurons by one mm -hmm. So these are going to be subtle effects, and they're going to be enough, however, to show up epidemiologically. So. In experimental design, that may not be obvious if you have five animals in a group, but if you have uh, uh, 200 million people in the population, it's going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in just making a quick correlation between the state of the brain and what type of corollaries we do have, whether it be neuropeptides, neurohormones. I do think we're missing, actually, a third neurohormone, um, being that something is uniquely created in the, in the brain chemistry during these states of consciousness, and that they should be measurable well, and, and or generally through a PET well, scan you. or an MRI. No, it wouldn't be an fMRI because uh, that's, that's much too crude. Um, you're looking for something that's a long ways away in terms of technology. fMRI is at most a measure very, first of all, the resolution is only is greater than a millimeter. Mm. And you're looking at molecular activity, which molecules uh, exist at, at the level of... Uh, I didn't mean, sorry, here. I didn't mean using the fMRI specifically for the searching of these neuropeptides, but general uh, latent energies that come out of these neurohormonal productions, which may show up as simple aspects of heat generation and or activity stimulated areas. Okay, that's a fair idea. Heat, heat is going to be very difficult to measure in the brain because you're dealing with 310 degrees Kelvin. And or uh, uh, and yeah. some of the aspects which would be correlated to spin states of the electron uh, conductivity occurring through the stepping process of these. These are all splendid ideas. Yeah. Spin states are very difficult to measure, and if you're measuring them, you're usually measuring them with very, very strong fields to knock them out. That's the problem with using MRIs. But your idea is a splendid one, and you may want to try this. You may, as opposed to, uh, you may want to look for metabolites. Mm -hmm. Now, we do know that some people make DMT mm -hmm. um, in their brain, which is basically the active ingredient of ay ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's also known that with marked individual variability, some people may make biochemical sequences that are not like the norm. Mm -hmm. And what defines a drug is basically a chemical not made in the brain or in your mm -hmm. body. But some people make chemicals that other people would be called drugs because they make them in their body. Mm -hmm. One compound you may want to look at, of course, is melatonin, which is remarkably sensitive to magnetic fields, mm -hmm. negative quickly. But you're right, I think uh, that would be a great target, a great trigger, or mm -hmm. I should say a great tag, for looking at uh, uh, the presence of magnetic fields. But it, it's going to be probably indirect through a metabolite. See, there's a correlation with what I'm finding that the initiate was trying to produce, which 
was in some cases in the Indian, the Vedic, through Mandala use. And I guess I'm trying to show quantitatively how these processes do directly affect the neurochemistry. Well, and excellent. A lot of this does have to do with geometry as they're finding actually.